if they had told me the sky was blue, I would have looked out the window just to check to make sure. <laughs> Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 13, An Absolute Distrust of Unitarians, with Kevin George. I'm your host, Mark Kane. This podcast is part of the UCA, whose goal is to help Unitarian Christians find fellowship and to provide resources. I produce these podcasts primarily for Unitarian Christians, but I understand that they can be interesting to others as well. If that's why you're listening, well, thanks for joining us. Several times in the past, I've mentioned the way Unitarian Christians get treated. I've noted this treatment is a big reason we created the UCA in the first place. Today, listen closely to Kevin's experience. There is a wide variety of ways that people deal with minority positions, and some, as you will see, can be remarkably ungenerous. All the more reason Kevin's story is profound. Listen to where he was when he started his journey. The distance from there to here is vast. Kevin George, I appreciate that you are willing to join me today and tell your story. Sure, you're welcome. I'm glad to be here, and I hope my story can be of help to others. Well, let's just go back to the beginning then and talk about how you grew up and, well, what started out your process of becoming a Bible student and changing your views and all of the things that took place. Okay. I was born while my father was in seminary. I grew up in a very conservative Baptist Christian home. My parents were very good Christian examples to me. They were missionaries for about 37 years in South America. I spent about eight of those years with them. Wow. I did some pulpit filling. I've done a variety of things. I've never been in full-time Christian ministry, but I have three of my siblings who have been, still to this day, they're in full-time mission work. My father, even though he's retired, he still does a jail ministry, and so ministry and the gospel is, is a big part of what my family is about. Some people may be unsure of what you mean when you say conservative Baptist, because there are several varieties of Baptist groups. Maybe just explain what that would mean. Right. It's more conservative than the Southern Baptist. It's more along the lines of what today is called fundamental independent Baptist. Okay. Although there are degrees of that even within that, some very hardcore and more moderate, but we are, I guess you could say, on the more moderate side. You can get into some pretty crazy stuff in that. For the most part, it's very conservative mm -hmm. and very big on reading the Bible, supposedly believing that we are drawing our doctrines from the Bible and not from outside sources. One church I was at, they had a big poster on the wall where people could put their name, and yeah. as they read through the Bible, they could mark off every book of the Bible they read. So that's what I did, mm -hmm. and I've read through the Bible from cover to cover many times. Mm -hmm. We just take the Bible very seriously, and we try to live accordingly as best we understand it. I see. Where did you grow up, and where was most of your experience then at these churches? Most of my growing up, other than the South America, was in the North United States, Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, hmm. that general area. And when you were in South America with your family, about what age range would that have been? From age 10 to age 19, and then I went back for a time numerous years later. I also did a couple of years on my own trying to do a mission project in Paraguay, South America. Wow, okay. In your conservative upbringing, the idea of doctrines, specifically doctrines of the Trinity and other very important doctrines, how were those emphasized, and what was your perspective on the criticalness of these kinds of doctrines? Doctrine in general is very important in these churches. Mm -hmm. It's not that every Sunday is like going to seminary, but it's, it's a critical element. It's, yeah. Since it's very gospel-oriented, their version, I guess you could say, of the gospel message where Jesus has to leave heaven and only God can die for your sins, it's a very major part of the message. Mm -hmm. And of course, going to heaven when you die, that's the big, big thing. Mm. They have no perception of God's kingdom on earth. Really? I, I had virtually none of that. Now, they do believe usually in the pre-tribulation and that kind of thing, maybe the thousand-year reign. But it's like, uh, even after that, it's like, oh, fine, we're done, we're getting out of here. 
earth is like this is something we got to get through because the real goal is is heaven mm. very little emphasis on resurrection or not even an emphasis it's just a side commentary every once in a while oh wow things like the trinity it's assumed they will bring it up every once in a while usually it's not taught very intently mm. but doctrines are brought up very frequently during the preaching and a lot of the preaching is exegetical uh, it's always with the spin that they learned in their seminary. Yeah. I've picked up a few books over the years on cults. And one of the books, I don't remember who made it, but the thing that stood out to me was the first point on the list. A cult is somebody who denies the deity of Christ. Now that I think back on it, is that the kind of emphasis or material that like a conservative Baptist movement would be putting out? Very, very much. If you want to stir up the crowd, if you want to get an emotional response from the, the audience. One of the very common things is to bring up the Jehovah Witnesses and mm. and you bash them. They are like the devils themselves. It's one of the worst things to ever be, would be a Jehovah Witness mm. because they deny the deity of Christ. They're all guaranteed going to hell. They're the ultimate bad guy. So you don't ever want to be associated with anything that may end up denying the deity of Christ because Cults use Bible passages out of context. Mm. That's one of the things that cults do. And cults will ignore the grammatical and historical context in the texts. Mm -hmm. They will change definitions of words. So they'll ignore the actual meaning of words, or they'll misquote verses mm. to deceive people into believing things that they want them to believe. Or they will ignore alternative explanations that will better fit the text. Or they will conveniently ignore passages that will refute their claims. Yeah. All of these are things that the cults do. We don't do those yeah, things. You, right. The way you just listed all those things off, I was like, yes, they must have really emphasized that for you to be so familiar with. Like, how often did that come up? Was that a regular occurrence to have time spent discussing those people, the cults? Well, it may be more like uh, different seasons. Usually churches have different themes, different se seasons of the year. and mm -hmm. But through the years, those are things I picked up on that are one way or another in Sunday school or in the preaching brought out frequently that we're the good guys because we don't do this. Yeah, And the liberal churches out there, not just the cults, but all these other churches that are not like us, these are the things that they will do. That's why you should come to our church and be part mm -hmm. of our church because we don't do these things. I see. That clearly painted a picture for you about those people, and you knew where you wanted to be. You wanted to be safely on this side. On the biblical side, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yes, I want to be on the side of the good guys. When you were hearing those kinds of descriptions of those people versus you guys, did you ever stop and decide, well, I'm going to look into it to see if it's like that? Or did you just accept that, that, yeah, I'm being told clear truth, that's what those people are? And we're not. It's a combination as far as that that's what those people are. Yes, I accepted that. Mm -hmm. Now, there were some topics that are what I would call peripheral topics mm. that I did dig into myself and I came to some different conclusions. But I would have never, ever suspected that some of the core doctrines would even have any reason to be questioned at all. I just never had any suspicion about that. I just never checked into any of them because surely of all doctrines, those would not be incorrect. To be fair, like there are a lot of Bible verses like Jesus saying, I came down from heaven, mm -hmm. which fits into their way of explaining things. So yeah. those are the verses they point to that instead of giving the full picture. And of course, they don't give the Jewish flavor of the scripture. It's just given what fits in their doctrinal box. So you only get one size fits all, I guess you could say. Yeah. <laughs> and so there was no reason for me to think anything other than that on those major doctrines. Mm -hmm. The fact that you had missionaries in your family, you had a very evangelistic fervor. What were some of the methods then that, that you guys used to reach people? In South America, it's very common to pass out gospel tracts. Mm -hmm. Other things that we would do at different times and with different pastors, we would often go door to door in groups of two. We would ask right off the bat after introducing ourselves, are you 100% sure that if you die tonight, you would go to heaven? Mm. 
And if they would permit us to engage in a conversation, we would try to lead them down the Romans road Mm. and try to get them to believe that Jesus died for their sins and was buried and rose again. And if you accept him by faith, then you go to heaven. I spoke previously with a fellow named Jason, who is a Unitarian Christian in the pew in a Southern Baptist church for years. And I'm curious, would somebody have been able to manage it would, it would seem like it would be harder in a conservative Baptist church than perhaps the slightly less conservative Southern Baptist church. Yes, in a Southern Baptist church, I would imagine, of course, it would depend on the pastor. It might come up briefly in Sunday school in passing or something, but it's it's not in your face. Yeah. It, just occasionally in the songs, and that's about it. Hmm. Whereas in these more conservative Baptist churches, while they may not mention the words, the Trinity— nearly every Sunday, but the gospel message is almost always wrapped around that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and only God can be perfect enough to do that. Those kind of assumptions that they're bringing to the table. And also the songs in these conservative Baptist churches are much more doctrinally intense. They're more like hymns, the hymns of the faith. Okay. And which I really like. I like songs with meat in them, Yeah, but then some of the meat is, you could say, almost brainwashing. Mm. Many of the songs are very unscriptural, Mm. and it it fits in with their doctrine, and they think it's scriptural. Right. But if you actually were to ask them, where's that that part of the song, where's that in the Bible, they wouldn't be able to tell you that. Mm. I'm just curious if it ever happened where you had members in your church they're like, I'm not so sure about that, or I question that, or you know, even question the Trinity. Was questioning common might be another way to ask that. Uh, well, in these churches, the only times I heard questions were mostly from people who were very new believers, mm. and they're very, very minimal, basic questions. Yeah. There were a few times where I attempted to point out something that was being taught or said that didn't fit, not about the Trinity, but just other topics. Yeah, And it was very much frowned upon. Hmm. Even though they'll say, we believe the Bible, we only preach what's in the Bible, we encourage you to look up the Bible and check up on us to see if it's true or not. Yeah. Well, they say that, but if you ever confront them about it, even in a very gentle spirit, at least my experiences on a couple, mm-hmm. at least two occasions I can think of, it did not go well at all. Hmm. Basically, questioning ends up being discouraged very much, at least from my experience. And that, that okay. it depends on the pastor, and it depends yeah. on the attitudes involved. But that has been my experience. Mm. You're thinking too hard. That That's not important. We're just about the gospel. Okay. I had one experience. I taught in a Christian school for one year, teaching mm-hmm. high school, uh, secondary education. The preacher which seemed to be so friendly from the outside. Once I became an employee, it was a very different situation. He was a very authoritarian individual. And I put up with it, put up with it. I don't remember what triggered this, but I finally had enough. And I decided to approach him with my Bible in hand and as humbly as I possibly could, made an appointment, sat down with him in his office and told him I was just having some struggles about the way the leadership is being handled at the church, and I'd like to share some Bible verses with you about the subject. And he immediately just put up his hand and said, Kevin, I know what the Bible says, but this is the way we do things here. Those were his exact words. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Oh. And it's like, okay, this guy's a total fake. He preaches Bible, Bible, Bible on Sunday, but he is, has no intention of actually living it. I finished that school year, I had another three months or so, because I didn't want to leave my students and parents hanging. As soon as that year was over, I was out of there. That was my last, I guess, deep being into the fundamental mm. Baptist churches. Ever since then, I've, I've maybe attended here and there, but I've more stayed on the fringes. I just can't put up with uh, extreme authoritarian attitudes that many of these preachers have. Oh, wow. You know, Kevin, do you have any thoughts about how it got to that point? You know, what is it that turned 
some of the leaders into authoritarian people like that? I fault it mostly on the church style and church structure. The church structure today is a very organizational, corporate style. While I totally understand that there needs to be leadership, well, the, the, the passage I was going to bring to the, this pastor was in 1 Peter 5, where it says to the shepherds to take care to not lord over the flock, which is among you. Mm. Not even beneath you, it's among you. So you're one of the flock, so don't lord over the rest of the flock. Yes, you're the leader, but that doesn't give you authority to smash or crush those whom you are leading. You're supposed to be leading them, come follow me, not get out of my way. Mm. Or going behind them, and you're beating them with a rod, forcing them forward. Mm -hmm. So leadership is important, but the style of leadership is the problem. When you said, among you, in that verse, it reminded me of the passage where Jesus will come from among you. He will be from you. Yeah, that's uh, Deuteronomy 18. Yeah. Uh, one from among your brethren. Right. Jesus is one of us. He's not an authoritarian. He's leading them. He's drawing them unto him, which is the example of the shepherd. It's to say, follow me. That's Jesus' teachings, follow me. Yes, when he comes back again, that's his role as Messiah to rule with a rod of iron, but that's yeah. another phase. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what you thought of the Trinity when you were growing up as a Trinitarian. How did you perceive it? It's known that there are many variations on the doctrine of the Trinity. Dale Tuggy talks about those a lot. But where was it for you? How did you conceive of it? I never really tried to define it in very strict terms. It was always very generic. Nobody ever really challenged me on it. Mm -hmm. I knew that the cults didn't believe in it, but who cares? I don't, I'm not going to go try to figure it out just for the sake of the cults. And so I just never bothered getting into it in that detail. But I did have a few instances where the topic in one form or another came up in my life. Yeah. One was while I was teaching that one year in Christian school where I don't even remember why, but somehow in one of the classrooms, the phrase, my father and I are one, came up by some of the students. Yeah. And I looked at that passage and had already made my own conclusions. And I said to the students, you know, that verse, my father and I are one, I don't think that applies to the Trinity. Hmm. Because when you read it in context, that's not at all what they're talking about. It's it's about what Jesus does is what the Father does. They're doing this together. Mm -hmm. My Father and I are one. That's just what they're doing. So one or more of the students said, oh, Mr. George, I was the teacher, Mr. George, you don't believe in the Trinity. Oh, Mr. George, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> and I said, oh, yes, I, I, I certainly believe in the Trinity. Just because it does not apply to one verse doesn't mean that there are not many, many other verses that apply. You know, there's John 1 and mm -hmm. Philippians 2, and but, yeah. but yes, I assured them I believe in the Trinity. That's not in question at all. I'm just saying that this one verse, I don't think that one applies. And so I kind of <laughs> uh, got out of that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's close, man. But... Uh, I but I did believe it. I was being serious. I I did not. I was not trying to pull their leg. I yeah. Uh, you know, we you hear about different Trinitarians who've expressed opinions about verses, which say, well, that one's not a good verse to teach the doctrine, and that's not a good verse to teach the doctrine. And you could probably find, and I think people have collected these quotes from all sorts of Trinitarians who, when you put them all together, basically discount every verse that would teach the Trinity. Because Trinitarians can look at those and say, well, those, not that one. Like, <laughs> and here you were doing that in class. <laughs> yes. And they caught, they almost caught you on it. That's funny. <laughs> uh -huh. And then I had another incident I could bring up that um, in the year, I think it was 2007, I was watching some video uh, about the life of Christ. Mm -hmm. It was a well-done video. I don't even remember who did it, but somebody was portraying Jesus in the video. There's an actor doing the miracles and then being arrested and crucified and so forth and raised again. But watching the video made me very angry because I saw a man in the place of Jesus. Mm. 
And while I knew that as a point of doctrine, Jesus was fully man yeah. and fully God, to me it was merely an almost insignificant point of doctrine, like one little dot on a white sheet of paper. And so to even have someone act the part of Jesus made me very angry. Really? So angry I told myself, if that's how angry I'm going to get watching videos about the life of Christ, I should not watch any more videos about the life of Christ. Wow. And so I had Jesus very, very exalted, like he's so much God, you should not even think of him in his human capacity. I mean, yes, you can acknowledge that as a point of doctrine, but don't even go there. Mm. I absolutely had Jesus fully exalted as I could have him in my mind without going outside of the bounds and, and not even admitting he was a man. So... I had zero expectation in my life that I would ever think otherwise. It'd be kind of like asking someone to deny gravity. Why would you huh. deny gravity? That is just the way things are. Mm. So the only reason to deny Jesus is fully God would be because you just must hate God. I mean, you must be someone who's like these cult members who is possessed of the devil going around doing demonic work, trying to get people to go to hell with you or something like that. It, it was just inconceivable to me how anyone could even remotely question the deity of Jesus. Mm. That's how hardcore I was. So those cult people, those Jehovah's Witnesses, were clearly on your no list. Like They, they had done the worst to God. Yes. In fact, I would have almost—this is— a possible thought that I, I could have had, that if one of my sons was going to be either a Jehovah Witness or a Satanist, I might have chosen Satanist because everybody knows that that's wrong. But a Jehovah Witness is like a Satanist dressed up with a tie and a suit oh. and is going around spreading false doctrine, actively pursuing people to get them to go to hell. Whereas a Satanist, well, you can just look at those wackos, you know that they're messed up. Uh -huh. And so if I had the choice, I might have preferred that one of my children be a Satanist more than a Jehovah Witness. Huh. So you had that mindset that I, I've seen illustrated somewhere. If you went to your pastor and said, I'm not sure there's a God, he would invite you to dinner and talk to you for hours. But if you went to your pastor and said, I don't think Jesus is God, he would ask you to leave. Yes, I very well could have done that. And this second part, what you described, the, the idea that somebody who believes differently is capturing people, dragging them down with them because they're like dressed up in, in the tie, as you said. That's fascinating. Yes, that makes sense. That's why people get so upset that church-like people are teaching bad doctrines. It's just insidious to them. Yes. Right. It's doctrine of demons. Oh, Wow. You were probably not the only one who had that sort of a perspective. This was common then in your denomination, to think that way. Other people might have said the same thing about Satanism as you did. Oh, certainly, yes. Like I've said before, if any preacher wants to rise the ire of a crowd, he would bring in these cults mm. and stomp and spit and kick and scream and whatever. That, that would get the crowd stirred up to be on his side. That happened many, many times. Oh, that's, I get it. I get it. That makes sense. That's why sometimes, let's say on Facebook or other places, we stumble into a conversation where the person on the other side of the conversation seems amazingly aggressive in their putting you down yes. for your doctrinal understanding. It's not just, no, I think you're incorrect on this. It's like, get behind me, Satan. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You are spreading doctrine of demons. You are being, you are a tool of Satan himself. Right. I would say that's probably pretty effective for keeping people from researching. I mean, if you think that's the doctrine of demons, are you going to like go get a book and read up on it? Yeah. Why even be curious about it? It's, it's dangerous stuff. It's like playing with fire. Don't go there. Yeah. So you have a large swath of people in very conservative and fundamentalist churches who would not, would not even think to go pick up a book like Keegan Chandler's book, be like, oh, I'm going to read that this week. No, if I'd seen something like that years ago, I would have had an, an emotional yuck reaction to it. Oh, I touched the trash. I need to go wash my hands. Wow. It seems like in this case, 
that belief came from the kind of tone that the church took against cults, that you hear that enough times and you will be convinced, yeah, you probably don't even want to touch that. You don't want to read that. You don't want to see that. You don't have to be told. You know, Nobody has to come to your house and say, uh, Kevin, that book that you have on your shelf, you should probably throw that out now because you were already completely in on the avoid the materials that are bad. Yes, by making it become an emotional reaction, there was no need to get into a deep doctrinal refutation of it because if you get people to have this internal yuck factor, Mm -hmm. then they won't even think about it and they won't engage with anybody that's going to actually have a deep discussion on it because it is revulsive to them. It's not that there's a specific course that they're put through that brainwashes them. It's just the general tone of the church environment year after year after year that inculcates that, uh, like branding a cattle, it just it imprints it on the mind. Mm-hmm. I don't think that most of these people are intentionally being deceitful. Like mm. my my parents, my my family, my siblings, yeah. they're wonderful people, and they have no interest in conniving and deceiving people into believing things. They grew up the same just like I did. They just never had that aha moment to start questioning. Okay. And also, if it's their career, like some of my family, Mm -hmm. then there's also an additional barrier because they would lose their career. They would be thrown out on the street. So it does not behoove them to even remotely question anything. And if any questions do come up, go talk to some other expert about that. Mm -hmm. It's not healthy for them to deal with it. And I understand that, and I'm not going to be the judge of that. God knows the heart of the person. And if they're trying to be deceitful versus they themselves are just ignorant. Yeah, yeah. So I I don't get into judging the motives. Now, I do think some people are scholarly enough to know better, but those are the exception, not the rule, in the circles that I've been in. One of the criticisms I hear leveled at cults is that, well, they're controlling. They they will tell you what to read and what not to read. That's part of the way they manipulate and they control. It sounds like what you're describing is indirectly creating the exact same scenario that they would point and say the cults do that deliberately. Exactly, yes. Without telling them what books not to read by getting them to have either emotional responses or just complete total distrust of any of what might be the bad guys, Mm -hmm. then that automatically prevents them from being willing to look at anything. Mm. Uh, So those books or materials, if they ever come across them, they just immediately throw them away. Wow. So Kevin, what started to crack this veneer of the teachings are all right, the church has got everything properly and in place, what caused the first moment of uncertainty? The first pinprick, I guess you could say, because at the moment that's all it was, but it was when I was reading my Bible, just like I have a habit of do every morning, I started reading the book of Acts, mm-hmm. chapter 1, and of course I read through it and uh, it says that Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And then it goes on that when the disciples came together, they were asking Jesus, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And I remember kind of chuckling to myself, (laughs) these disciples, they just don't get it. It's They're thinking about Jesus setting up a kingdom here in Israel, here on earth, and it's it's about going to heaven. That's that's what it's really all about. Mm -hmm. And then I paused a little bit. And I remembered what I just read. Jesus spent 40 days with them, teaching them many things concerning the kingdom of God. And having been a teacher before, I just paused. 40 days. If I taught my students something for 40 days and they didn't get it, I would have to say something's wrong with the teacher. That's mm. an, I'm saying that Jesus is an incompetent teacher. And especially since it says they were asking him. It's not like one guy, a doubting Thomas, asking him, Mm -hmm. one slow person that doesn't get it. They were asking him collectively. It's like, 
wait a minute, so either the disciples are wrong, or Jesus is a bad teacher, or maybe there's something here that I'm missing. Mm -hmm. And so I started meditating on that, of the kingdom to Israel. He was teaching them about the kingdom of God. And so so verses that, of course, I knew since some of them since childhood started coming to my mind, like the Lord's Prayer, and he says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, he doesn't say, take us to your kingdom. It's your kingdom be done on earth, your kingdom come here. Mm -hmm. And then in Revelation, uh, the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven, coming to earth. But, okay, well, where are the verses that actually say we go to heaven? And, of course, I thought of John 14, where in my Father's house there are many mansions, but yeah. Wait a minute. I know that that one doesn't actually apply because the word mansions there, I looked that up, and in the Greek, it's actually the word dwellings. Hmm. And also in my father's house, for the Jews, that was a reference to the temple. So somewhere in the background, I'd picked up these little pieces. I just never put them together. Hmm. But where does it actually say we go to heaven when we die? Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, I know enough Bible, I should should be able to answer that right away, but uh, uh, where is it? Mm. I got to researching and found, well, the closest thing I can find is in Revelation 7 about the martyrs under the throne of God, if that's taken literal. Mm -hmm. They're under the throne of God, but they're asleep. And they wake up for some, somehow, and they're given white robes and told to go back to sleep. Well, they're not enjoying heaven, and they're the martyrs, I (laughs) <laughs> if anybody should be enjoying heaven, it'd be the martyrs. Where are the rest of the people? Hmm. So, I, of course, I immediately go to the internet, start looking on the internet, verses about heaven, verses about heaven. And I got to realizing these are about the kingdom of God on earth, or about resurrection. Things that, when you actually look into them, they're not actually about heaven. It's like using the word glory and projecting it to be heaven, but it's actually a condition, not a place. Hmm. Something's wrong here. Ever since a child, it was all about going to heaven, going to heaven, going to heaven. And Mm -hmm. it never crossed my mind one bit to even think that there was anything different than that. You'd read through the Bible so many times. So that section in Acts then, you had probably a similar reaction every time you would read it, like you would kind of chuckle about their inability to grasp it, and then you would continue on reading? Probably. I don't remember reacting that way because it probably happened so fast. This time I paused, Mm. let it soak in, and then that's what gave me the time to think back on what I had just read. Yeah, I don't know if that God did that, opened my eyes or what, but it's not like I opened my eyes instantly, but it it made me start to dig deeper. I was brought up sola scriptura, everything is from the scripture. Mm -hmm. Well, if we say we go to heaven when we die, that should come from the scripture. Once I started digging and found out, actually, the texts are primarily about the resurrection and about the kingdom of God on earth. It caused quite an emotional reaction in me, like, surely not. Surely I'm missing something. I've got to be missing something here. This can't be. This can't be right. The cults have, this must be a doctrine that the cults believe, but somebody somewhere has refuted this. Mm -hmm. So I go on the internet trying to find apologetic sites or whatever, But everything I was finding were these very flimsy assumptions that, of course, we go to heaven when we die. No one would seem to think that anything would be different. I finally concluded it must be the kingdom of God on earth. And it it, it was actually so nerve-wracking to me that even though I'm very close to my wife and I share almost everything with her, it was three months before I got around to talking about the subject because... I thought, surely I've got to be wrong, and I don't want to mislead her. Mm. Surely something somewhere is going to come up to show me that it is about going to heaven. I'm just missing it, and here it is. You had been stable in your church and doctrinal experiences, confident in what you were being taught, and now there was a hole in this. I mean, how did you feel about the organization, the church, knowing that you were seeing something different than what you were taught? It took some adjusting. It took some time for me to, first of all, settle in to be secure that what I had discovered actually was true because I was very insecure about myself. So surely I'm not the Bible expert and all these others are Bible experts. I trusted Mm -hmm. the experts. 
why haven't they said anything about this? Surely I've got to be wrong, they've got to be right, because they know the Bible even more than I do. But I knew from my background, if I were to question this, especially being a missionary kid and being mm-hmm. raised in a preacher's home, like, this is the kind of question that you would expect a new Christian to ask. But a veteran Christian coming out to ask this, they would be like, what have you been reading? The Bible. Nah, you haven't been reading the Bible. You've been reading some other literature. You've been reading something else. Mm. I would have been blown off like, okay, this guy, he, he's starting to question things. Don't trust him. You stay away from him. He's starting to get dangerous. Mm. Over a period of time, when I couldn't find any refutation, it solidified, and I explained it to my wife, and she couldn't prove me wrong either. She had less problem emotionally with it than I did. Of course, she doesn't have the preacher background that I have. Mm, yeah. In researching this, I found that there's a book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Mm-hmm. Because I figured, well, I want the experts to tell me. But he actually himself concludes that it is the kingdom of God on earth. We're just calling it heaven. Huh. And in the appendix, he brings out that the flying away to heaven doctrine is from the Greek philosophy that's mixed in with Christianity. Here is someone that was Trinitarian, I could trust. At least he got that one right. Mm -hmm. He saw the same thing I did. And then he explained the history of it, how that came into Christianity, Mm -hmm. that the gospel of the kingdom of God on earth was pushed aside in exchange for the philosophical component from Greek philosophy that happened early in the early centuries of Christianity. Mm. I also went online and started searching about the kingdom of God and found some of the biblical Unitarian sites, which I didn't know were biblical Unitarian. Yeah. And I was learning some things, nice things about the kingdom of God until all of a sudden I found out that these were Unitarian. Oh, no. (laughs) Click, out, done. Not interested. Yeah. If they had told me the sky was blue, I would have looked out the window just to check to make sure. If... if, (laughs) If a, if a Unitarian had counted my change at the store and I knew they were Unitarians, I might have counted it twice to make sure it was it was correct. <laughs> oh. I just had that total, total, absolute distrust for anything a Unitarian might have to say. They, mm. Like, it was impossible for them to read the Bible and understand anything, get anything right. Oh, man. They did an effective job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I was very well-trained and very stubborn. <laughs> That's why it, took, it takes a long time. The better trained you are, the longer it takes to to change your thinking. All right. I I think that it's helpful for people to see what happens when you break out of one mindset that, that everything you've been told was absolutely right, and then you realize, well, maybe there's something different. Well, what happens is you start to become comfortable looking at Scripture again and allowing yourself to ask questions, to read and to really consider, and to do like what you said, pause. Well, what is really happening here? It's a powerful step. Yeah. The side effect of that change was that I started reading the Scripture much more slowly Mm. and carefully, and then checking Scripture with Scripture more than I ever had before. Ah. Not just trusting the translation, but rather being a real Berean to see if these things really are so. Mm -hmm. And so I got used to investigating my beliefs. That was like the first step. I also learned to try to read the Bible from a Jewish perspective and how that changed some of the meanings and some of the instances of what they were saying versus what we were told it meant. Yeah. And so it got me used to having a healthy criticism, not questioning everything in a bad sense, but rather taking a fresh look at everything to see if it actually was as scriptural as I had been led to believe. Yeah. Well, you see, Kevin, that's where you actually you started to go wrong. <laughs> yes. In their eyes, that's, I, I became dangerous. Well, I'm excited to know where this unfolds and what happens. So in the next episode, we will continue. Thank you, Kevin, for being willing to share and for giving us a glimpse into a denomination, into a group that, that some of us have never even experienced. I appreciate that. You're welcome. I got some criticism last week that was thoughtful and shared out of love. I am certain that if one person thinks something, there are likely many more. So Philip here may be speaking what you're thinking too. That's why it's important for me to share it. Philip writes, 
I have enjoyed your interviews, but I must tell you that your sarcasm is very disheartening. I have to preface sharing your podcasts with a word to excuse your pride and sarcasm toward those who don't currently accept our understanding. Please, brother, humble yourself and be more mindful of those who have yet to be blessed with the truth. You have been given a blessed opportunity to reach many. Do not follow the path of the majority who preach only to those who are in agreement with them. This practice is unfruitful. Pray and seek to speak to the lost with all humility. Thanks, Philip. You are correct about the sarcasm. It's my sense of humor, and, and I get that it could be off-putting. This podcast actually is intended for those who are in agreement, Unitarian Christians. I do not produce it for Trinitarians or unbelievers. I produce it for you, and my goal is that you are encouraged, energized, inspired, and that most of all you realize you are not remotely alone. That is what I'm doing here. Though, I am fully aware that others are listening. I acknowledge them. I talk to them directly, too. And I suppose that's where it gets challenging. I frankly don't know if I really could do both at once, offer insights into living as a Unitarian, like Anna Brown's story in Episode 6, working at the Colson Center, and simultaneously providing teaching geared toward those not with us. Those two things don't overlap well, if at all. But it's good to know that this is what you think, and it's humbling to know that what I've produced is worth sharing. I don't yet know what to do about this cross-purpose conundrum. Please be patient with me, and if I may impose, offer a prayer for me and this podcast. But even more, pray for each other and what God would have us do. I'm just a small part of this, and I'm sure many of you will achieve way more than me. Again, thanks, Philip. Let's stay in touch. You, too, may reach out to me, podcast, at unitarianchristianalliance.org. I'd love that, though what I'm really hoping for is short audio messages that I can include in future episodes. We're running short on those. Click the record in the show notes, or even call the feedback line, 615 615- 581-1158. And we've finally launched the UCA podcast email list. I'm excited, of course, though I know it's only an email. Here's what you'd get if you signed up. An email for each episode release. I'll include a little extra, like thoughts about the episode. It's a nice touch, I hope. But if you really want to know, the actual motivation behind the email is my mom. Hi, mom. She isn't a technical whiz, but she can do email. I still recommend you subscribe or follow in a podcast player, but to the emailers, I became an email that I might win some. To get on the email list, go to the podcast page, podcast.unitarianchristianalliance.org. All it takes is an email address and a first name, if you like. There's also a link here toward the top of the show notes to get signed up. Also, If you want to be reminded of the shining moments of the podcast, then follow uca.podcast on Instagram. We distill some of the best quotes and post them with our odd blue and orange color scheme. uca.podcast. It's like a decorative highlight reel for each show. Kevin, I'm looking forward to our next talk. You definitely had what I'd call a Unitarian deficit. (laughs) Yeah, that's an understatement. I appreciate your time, and I greatly respect the dedication and endurance it took to get to where you are now. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well.